when most people hear the word algae, very nice things do not come to mind. The, the words that come to people's heads are ugly, slimy, nuisance, dangerous, and most painful to my heart, worthless. I have a very different view of this. When I hear the word algae, I think beautiful, fascinating, untapped potential. Now, that's not surprising because I've spent over half of my life studying these wonderful organisms. Let me try to sway you to my side for a moment. My group, the golden algae, have the largest and smallest photosynthetic organisms with a nucleus on the planet. They make 25% of every breath you take. <sighs> Thank you, algae. They make all of the essential dietary oils that you need to live. We call them fish oils, even though algae do all the work. Um, they exist in a kingdom that you've never heard of. These little organisms are absolutely critical to our daily lives, yet we pay virtually no attention to them. Now, that's great for a person like me because there's nothing but discovery left to do. And I want to frame this in context of land plants. There are about 300,000 land plants. We found about 45,000 of those species that have something useful for us. We can build a house, we can make cloth, we can make medicine. That's about 15% of the species. Now, if we contrast that with a microalgae, there are about three million species of microalgae. We use six for human activities. <laughs> That's 0.000002%. Nothing but room to improve right there, which is pretty awesome. <laughs> okay, now we can all, now why don't we study these little critters more? Well, the reality is that's probably human nature. Think about how many times we dismiss something or don't think something's important because we've never heard of it. That's just what we do. But I'll also argue that we can agree that it's probably worthwhile to at least spend a portion of our public funds on research and discovery. That's pretty easy. We understand that those things can increase our quality of life, they can provide security and social infrastructure for us, and many times they'll promote economic development. Now, disease control is a pretty obvious example of this. That's a no-brainer. We obviously are interested in controlling human health diseases and making sure that things that can harm us as humans are controlled. How do, do we decide to do things that are, are less obvious? And the reality is probably listening to professors is not such a good way to do it. Anybody that doubts that just needs to pop into an 8 a.m. class and peek at the faces of the students. <laughs> we've got limited funds, though, and we've got to make a decision about where we're going and what we're doing. So, uh, so it's not easy to evaluate what things will increase the quality of life, enhance social infrastructure, and promote economic development, especially when we consider that it's research and we don't know what answer we're going to get necessarily um, before we start. We all know that hindsight is 2020, and we can look back at things and say, oh, that was a good idea. The Internet's a wonderful example of this. Today, everybody looking back would say, hey, that Internet thing, good. Glad we funded that. I can promise you, though, when we were doing dial-up, we were not so sure that it was a great idea. Okay, it's not easy to figure out this. And the reality is there are lots of folks out there that are experts on lots of things. And they all want your funding and your support. And we have to figure out how to sort through that. It's also really difficult to communicate. And scientists, you know, we're, we're not the best communicators. So we often maybe try to scare you into funding. And the reality is, I want you to think about Ebola, SARS, the bird flu. Holy cow, an asteroid's going to hit the planet and kill us all. Right? You'd better fund me or you're going to die. Right? And that's not such a good thing. I think that that constant scare tactic has really started to erode the trust in science. We used to have a pretty good reputation. Think about sci how scientists were portrayed in the 1950s in science fiction movies versus how they were portrayed from the 1970s on. It was a pretty formulaic script, right? In the 1950s, some monster came from outer space. It's landing, it's going to doom us all. There was a great old scientist that had patches on the sleeve of his jacket. He goes and he researches the monster, which, you know, and then turns that data over to the hero. I do have a problem with that part of it, though, right? <laughs> the scientist was always a guy, and the scientist never got to be the hero. But nonetheless, 
That information was given to the hero. The hero killed the monster. The earth was saved. Everybody was happy. Now contrast that with, with this guy over here in the 70s, right? Here, the scientist only cares about his research, doesn't listen to public warnings, does the research anyway. He creates the monster. That monster threatens the earth. And then the citizens have to rise up, stop the monster, and stop the scientist. Right? The reality is we've got to be more rational than emotional about this. And I, I have three criteria that I like to use when we go through and prioritize what's important in terms of determining funding for science. Now, I attribute these three criteria to a colleague of mine, King Banyan, in the economics department. And they're pretty simple, right? The first one is there has to be return on that public investment. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we have to make money. It could be some societal improvement. It could be some social benefit. We get to decide if what we get out of it merits the investment that we put in. The second is it has to be something that the private sector is not willing to do. The reality is if a private group is going to do the research for us, we've got limited fundings, we need to stand out of the way and take our funds and send it towards another project that merits the funding. The last, which is probably the most important, is does the public support what we're going to do? If there's no public support for my idea, then I have no business spending public funds on it. Now, let's get back to, to algae for a second. One, because that's what I really like. But two, there's a couple of really good examples here. The first of these is going to be an example of where we get close to meeting these three criteria, but we don't quite make it. And that's algae-based biofuels. Many of you have probably seen the Exxon commercials on where we're going to grow algae to make oil, and then we're going to turn that oil into gasoline, and the world's going to be a happier place. The premise of that is pretty good, right? All algae or all petroleum used to be algae. And over a 90 million year period, they were transformed into our petroleum reserves. That's great. The, and, and so that gets us past a couple of the barriers. We've got public support. I certainly care about the cost of gas and whether there's gonna be gas available to fill up my tank. Two, you know, private businesses dabbling in it, but they're not ready to go whole hog into algal biofuels. But then there's that return on public investment thing. And this is where it falls short. And I'm going to try to keep it easy. One, because I'm a biologist and math is not my super, you know, forward point. Um, when we go through it, uh, a gallon of gas weighs about six pounds. In a very idealized situation, I could grow six pounds of algae and maybe get a gallon of oil out of that. If I'm really, really good, I could turn that gallon of oil into a gallon of gasoline. And if that gallon of gas was worth $4, by the way, a price I would rather not pay, um, I could sell a quart of that gasoline for a dollar. Now, the reality is no one's probably going to do that because that oil is worth a lot more on the food market. And I'm going to ask you guys to think about this for a second. Have you ever pulled up to the pump and filled your car up with algae gas? You haven't because it doesn't exist. But you can do this. I got this yesterday, locally. It's an algae oil that substitutes for olive oil. It sells for $22 a quart. Okay? Even I can figure out that, oh, by the way, on sale this week only. <laughs> I can even figure out that $22 is a lot better than a dollar. So we, we probably don't want to go down the road of funding algae-based biofuels. It falls down a little bit. Now, fortunately, I have another example, happens to be a research project that I'm involved in, of course, that I do think meets the three criteria. And it's a little bit of a, of a wild tangent. It has to do with bone therapy. And I will have to say that this is a project that I never in my dreams thought I was going to be involved in. And I owe a lot of thanks to two of my colleagues, Dr. Pamela Walsh and Dr. Fraser Buchanan, at the University of Belfast in Northern Ireland. They brought me into this. And what we all know about bones is that calcium obviously plays a very important role in bone health. What is lesser known is that silica, or glass, also has a really important role in bone health. Now, what we've known for some time is that we can use glass to stimulate bone growth. And there's this wonderful technology where you can take glass microspheres and mix them with a gelatin. 
And then you insert that gelatin with a glass in it in between a bone fracture. And the little silica beads stimulate bone cell division. And the bone fracture heals much, much faster. The dilemma with this technique is those glass microspheres have a very high rejection rate by our body. And they show up in places that we don't want them to show up in. It's kind of like relatives at Thanksgiving, but th that's okay. <laughs> anyway, so Pamela got this idea that she would like to replace the glass microspheres with diatoms. And diatoms are my favorite group of algae. And they're cool for a number of reasons, but a very cool thing about them is their cell walls are made of glass. And that made them an excellent substitute for these glass microspheres. So I grew up a bunch of these for her, and we were able to substitute them in the hydrogel for the glass beads. And they worked just as well as the glass beads. But what was more amazing is the rejection weight went to near zero. Now, that's very cool, but we can kick the neat factor up just a little bit. Um, my other colleague at the university, Fraser Buchanan, is also interested in structural materials and bones. And he has this amazing technique where he can use a 3D printer to print a scaffold to repair bones that are damaged by cancer. And what his group does is they take the scaffold, printed by the 3D printer, and insert it in a hole where cancerous tissue has been drilled out. And then the bone grows over that scaffold and heals itself. What Fraser was able to do was to take my diatoms and mix them with some other materials and make a unique 3D printer thread. We were then able to print diatom-based bone scaffolds. And what we found out is they outperform the scaffolds made from other nanomaterials. And we were obviously really excited about that. Now I can get pretty bold and say, I think that this pretty much checks the boxes on the three criteria, <laughs> right? I, I think we're getting some return on the investment. I'd like my bones to heal, right? No problem. I can guarantee you that prior to us starting this adventure, that no private company was going to think about diatoms and mixing them with bones. Just wasn't going to happen. And I'm pretty sure that the public support is there. Now, I have to leave that up to you because you folks are the public, but, but I think we're there. Now, what I want to point out is that when I started this story, and this is really important, probably none of you thought that I was going to connect algal research to bone therapy. That's a pretty wild thing. I had to stop and tell the story, but once I told the story, it was a pretty convincing story. And this is really the way we need to have the conversation about what we fund publicly. I need to have an idea. You need to challenge me. I need to defend that idea, and you should listen and criticize me. And if we do this together, we really can make the world a much better place.